Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to session three, day six of Cycle 2015. With us now, we have Rosalyn Ross, and I can't say I know her well, my dear friend, or say stories about her because I'd never met her before, but this is a very important topic to me. I have five children, and I'm looking forward to what Rosalyn's got to tell us about her parenting philosophy. So, Rosalyn, take it away. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosalyn Ross, and uh, my area of expertise is raising children. Um, but I've been told that my audience today is young people and not parents. Um, but I think what I have to say, except for Lobo, which sounds great, um, I think what I have to say will be valuable for young people, partly because I bet many of you plan to have kids one day. Um, so the information I have to share is relevant and imperative. It's so much better to hear these ideas before you have kids, ideally five years before, I think. Um, but even if you never plan to have kids, I think you will enjoy this talk because part of our journey in our 20s is to come up, come to terms with and undo what was done to us for our own good uh, while we were growing up. And a lot of my ideas address that. Um, I tend to talk, to talk pretty fast, so if you need me to slow down or repeat something, I guess you can maybe message uh, message me, I think, or Lobo can interrupt me and say, slow down. Um, so I will now commence. Um, human beings can relate to one another with either mutual respect and freedom or mutual attempts to control and force. Though I know many people who say they are fundamentally against relating to their fellow human beings with various methods of control, bribery, threats, manipulation, slavery, I know very few who hesitate to relate in those ways with the young human beings we temporarily refer to as children. In this talk, I will argue that one of our biggest barriers to freedom is our current parenting ideology. Um, in the first part of this talk, I will focus on the reasons why our current parenting ideology tends to lead to statism, and the second part of this talk will focus on my vision of the kind of parenting that will lead to a more free society. Um, whether you have children or not, the information I share with you now will add to your vision of how human beings can relate to one another respectfully, regardless of age. Um, our current parenting ideology is based on one simple rule. Reward the behavior you wish to see continue and punish the behavior you wish to see cease. As a professional executive nanny specializing in behavior modification, using that one rule for many years, I made children do what their parents thought was best for them, what the children would supposedly thank their parents for later. I trained young children to use the toilet and lose weight and not bite or hit. I made older children get better grades, lose weight, be more committed athletes, and be more competitive college applicants. What I learned is that you can manipulate, coerce, require, or train children to do or be pretty much anything, except happy. You can give them Prozac, but you cannot force children to be genuinely happy with their lives. Ten years ago, this made no sense to me. How could a teenage girl have been happier obese and flunking out of school than thin and on the honor roll? This was similar to something that happened when I was in college. I had just read Atlas Shrugged, and I gave it to everyone who was important to me. I begged them to read it but I couldn't make them read it. And even when they did read it, I couldn't make them care. Why is it that the first 10 pages of Atlas Shrugged was so exhilarating for me and so boring for my friends? I will answer these questions shortly. For now, I would like to propose that a controlled childhood does not usually create a free man. If we look at parenting from a philosophical angle, this makes perfect sense. Our current parenting ideology is based on behaviorism, which rests on the philosophical theory of determinism, the belief in human existence without consciousness, the belief that humans don't make conscious, rational decisions, they just respond to pain and pleasure, the belief that we are victims of our pain and pleasure programming, and therefore various forms of control are justified. Our current parenting ideology behaviorist parenting involves rewarding and punishing children, 
rewarding with approving glances, praise, prizes, and punishing with disapproving glances, threats, timeouts, and spankings. One reason this kind of parenting will not usually create a free man is metaphysical. Behaviors are actions we take to meet needs, to gain or keep what we value. When the parent controls the child's behavior with rewards and punishments, the parent severs the child's action from the child's values behind the action and makes himself, the parent, the value. Because the parent, not reality, determines when the child feels pain or pleasure. The child's entire orientation changes from reality to people as reality. In 1958, Nathaniel Brandon gave a series of lectures on objectivism. In one of those lectures, he talked about the man who lives not in a universe of facts, but in a universe of people. People, not reason, are his tool of survival. It is on them that his consciousness must focus. It is they who he must understand or please or placate or deceive or maneuver or manipulate or obey. It is his success at this task that becomes the gauge of his fitness to exist. His metaphysics has been replaced by what Brandon calls social metaphysics. Because a child's way of relating to the world, his metaphysical orientation, will be largely determined before he is five years old. I think the main cause of social metaphysics currently is behaviorist parenting. For example, when a child hits and is put in timeout, his parents think they are teaching him to associate the pain of hitting with the pain of timeout. What the child actually learns is not that hitting will lead to pain, but rather not pleasing his parents will lead to pain. The child does not need to study, understand, and conquer nature if he wants to avoid pain. He needs to study, understand, and conquer his parents. Fast forward 15 years. This child raised on behaviorism is now in college. Offer him Atlas Shrugged or Reality TV. Which one will offer him more information about the reality he thinks he needs to study, understand, and conquer? And now you know why so many of my friends thought Atlas Shrugged was boring. In addition to destroying the child's metaphysics, behaviorism also destroys the, child's, the child psychologically, moving the child from being intrinsically motivated, motivated by a self-interested pursuit of values, seeking a personal satisfaction derived from self-initiated achievement, to being extrinsically motivated, motivated by external rewards such as fame, grades, and praise, motivation that originates outside the individual. In his book, Teaching Johnny to Think, Leonard Peikoff asserts that external motivators can be used for good instead of evil, but extrinsic motivators by their very nature require that we suppress our real feelings, desires, and values and replace them with someone else's. Extrinsic motivators beget collectivism. It does not matter at all what we are trying to make our children do with extrinsic motivators. We can change the curriculum all we want. We can make it 100% Austrian economics. Likewise, it won't matter if we spank or use time out or do away with punishment altogether and just focus on rewards. The method is the message. In Punished by Rewards, Alfie Cohen shows that the mechanisms of reward and punishment to control an adult's behavior only work if the adult was rewarded and punished as a child. Cohn shows that the younger the rewards and punishments start, and the more consistently they are used, the more effective they will be, and the more necessary they will be. Cohn wrote, we often assume that a system of rewards and punishment simply take advantage of a fundamental feature of human character, when it actually turns people into reinforcement maximizing economic actors. Behaviorist parents say, you hit Jenny, you are bad. What you should be feeling is shame. Go stand in the corner and feel shame. You may feel better when I say so. Or, you didn't do your homework, you don't know what's best for you, and I do. I must make you do what's best for you. Only the goals I deem rational are worth pursuing. You can be rational by agreeing with me. Parents who use rewards and punishments are attempting to control their child's perceptions of reality so that the child will make the decisions the parents want him to make. The result for the child is confusion, 
insecurity and his own ability to interpret reality and massive repression. All of these things get in the way of rational thought. Ayn Rand wrote that the field of extrospection is based on two cardinal questions. What do I know and how do I know it? In the field of introspection, the questions are, what do I feel and why do I feel it? It is in the contemplation of the thinking about, the analyzing and understanding of these questions that we teach our children to use their brains to the best of their abilities. It is through these questions that we help our children develop an integrated mind, an understanding of why they feel what they feel about what they know. Extrinsic controls prevent these questions from being asked. It sounds like this. What do I feel and why? Oh, who cares? A beer will fix it. Or with babies, it sounds like this. What do you feel and why? Oh, who cares? Shh, sh shut up, sh shut up. That's what we're saying. Or with children, what do you feel and why? Oh, who cares? Go to your room until you can calm down and talk to me like a normal person. Parents think they are teaching their children self-control, but really they are teaching emotional repression. You may not feel that. You may not talk to me until you have properly repressed what you are feeling. Aletha Solter wrote, the repression of crying during infancy is so pervasive that most babies have well-established control patterns by the time they are six months old. These behaviors serve the purpose of repressing their strong emotions. Common control patterns in babies include thumb sucking or pacifier sucking, frequent demands to nurse for comfort rather than hunger, and attachment to an object such as a special blanket or teddy bear. These behaviors that we are told are normal child behavior are not actually normal child behavior. By the time they are ready for preschool, teachers expect children to have learned somewhat to control their emotions. But what is meant by control is actually repression. The emotional stress of repression often manifests as facial tics, another behavior considered normal in Western three to five year olds that is not actually normal in the human race. Extrinsic controls teach children to ignore the emotional information they receive from their own minds. The result is that children often fail to develop an intrinsic self at all. Instead, they adopt an extrinsic, unreal, socially acceptable self. Hence, the epidemic of 22-year-olds today who have no idea what they enjoy doing just for the sake of doing it. They are motivated by money, prestige, winning, approval, and above all, by pats on the head for being good boys and girls. They use behaviorism on themselves. They promise themselves a new outfit if they just lose 10 pounds or a week of self-loathing if they don't. And even if they find Atlas Shrugged and love it, they often don't know how to selfishly and righteously be themselves. Instead, they seek to be good little objectivists. Nathaniel Brandon wrote about how many good little objectivists he saw in his practice, people who missed the point people who were trained from birth to miss the point. He wrote, we sometimes hear people say, I have accomplished so much. Why don't I feel more proud of myself? It can be useful to ask, who chose your goals? You or the voice of some significant other inside of you? When admirers of Ayn Rand seek my services professionally, they often come with the secret hope, rarely acknowledged in words, that with Nathaniel Brandon, they will at last become the masters of repression needed to fulfill the dream of becoming an ideal objectivist. I have known many men and women who, in the name of lofty beliefs, crucify their bodies, crucify their feelings, and crucify their emotional lives in order to live up to that which they call their values. Just like the followers of one religion or another, absorbed in some particular vision of what they think human beings can or should be, they leave the human beings they actually are in a very bad place, a place of neglect and even damnation. Ayn Rand said, it is the hardest thing in the world to do what we want. Extrinsic controls make it the hardest thing in the world to even know 
what we want. This is why it seems to parents and high school teachers that extrinsic motivators simply must be used. Research has shown that children's intrinsic motivation declines every year over the course of traditional schooling. By the time they are in high school, most children rarely display any intrinsic motivation whatsoever. Behaviorism creates the problem for which more behaviorism is the only solution. And so behaviorism seems to work, not on an intrinsic or authentic level, but on a my human rodent pet is behaving in a way that pleases me level. This is why science shows that behaviorism will only ever work in the short term and will backfire in the long term. Repeated experiments done on how to best impose the value of altruism on young children have shown that children rewarded for altruistic behaviors will behave altruistically as long as the adult is there to approve of them. Then they will behave less altruistically when adults are not there. This is why extrinsically motivated adults find that, like children, they are only good when someone else is watching. This is another impulse of collectivism. People want someone to make them do what they can't make themselves do. They say they vote for a nanny state to keep all the bad people under control, but subconsciously they want a nanny for themselves. This is one of the impulses of some religions. If you can only be good when someone else is watching, they have a solution for you. This is what I didn't understand 10 years ago. You can get children to do or be pretty much anything, but goals achieved through external motivators will not make the children happy. But what about for parents? Being in control of one's children, playing the part of a controller, a serene, loving dictator, it makes parenting seem so easy in our heads. In reality, the parent is controlled by his role that requires him to be in control. Our tendencies, when we are in a controlling relationship, have a lot in common with social metaphysics. We can't be present with our child in this moment if we are busy thinking of ways to get him to do what we want him to do and monitoring whether what we are doing is working. This limits our ability to enjoy our relationship with our children, to be consciously aware of them, to connect. We can't allow ourselves to be truly visible to people we are trying to control. That would be showing our cards. They would know our weaknesses and then they might win. And this leads to a loss of integrity since we are not being honest. So we will lie more, this time to ourselves. We will tell ourselves that we do not have to be honest because the people we are trying to control don't merit our honesty. When we are controlling other people, we cannot allow ourselves to truly see them. Because to do so, we would have to be aware of the pain and suffering we are inflicting on them. So our tendency is to see their feelings as not real. That's not real pain children suffer when they cry. This is why controlling relationships can so easily lead to evil, because our tendency will be to fail to see the person we are trying to control as a person. As with slaves <laughs> or women, savages or heathens, we transform our adversary into something that needs to be controlled. Oh, children, they're irrational, like rats. They feel safer when you control them. They need it. Even if we do see the feelings those we control as real, our tendency is to convince ourselves their pain is okay. It's for their own good. In controlling relationships, the controller has a tendency to feel that he has not chosen to be in a relationship with those he is controlling. Rather, he sees himself as responsible for them, for their welfare, for their souls. It's hard to enjoy a relationship that is actually a duty. Since the parents don't see children as real people with whom they can connect, they often end up putting on a show. For example, a man might play the role of good father by mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, reading to the kids, doing bath time, helping his wife with the dishes, getting the highest paying job he can, and working his tail off. 
At first, he will pat himself on the back while he thinks I'm such a good father. But after a while, he will start to think that being a good father is a huge obligation, a chore, a long list of things to do. It won't be fun anymore, and if he could admit it to himself, he might find that he resents his wife and children, whom he sees as his slave drivers. But it's not them. It's the role. It's the lack of conscious awareness with which he's living his life. When we are playing roles, we have a tendency not to take responsibility for our choices. For example, someone playing the role of a soldier or policeman may not very closely examine what he is doing, or even feel responsible for the reality, the morality of his choices, if he sees it as part of his role, as just doing his job. Controlling relationships have a tendency to be exhausting. It takes a lot of energy to be inauthentic, to be actors, to do what we believe we should do to be good moms and dads, to suppress our true selves and how we really feel about reading the same book a hundred times. We often take on roles and scripts without even meaning to. Henry David Thoreau's Walden is my favorite example of this. Most people know the story. Thoreau built a cabin in the woods to discover himself and what life was all about for him. And he did it even though his neighbors thought he was a little weird. What he learned and wrote about is that the secret of life is knowing or finding your authentic intrinsic self and setting your own goals despite society's judgments. But what many people take away from Walden is that the secret of life is leaving society and living in a cabin in the woods. This is a misunderstanding. We should advance confidently in the direction of our own dreams. Whether we take on roles accidentally or whether roles are designed by those in power and handed to the masses for specific purposes, Controlling the roles and scripts of a society is a great way to direct the masses without them knowing it. One of my favorite professors at Wesleyan University, Katch Tololian, clarified this idea for me when he said, those who create normal rule the world. Whether it's, this is what a nursery looks like, or this is what an education looks like, or this is what an expertise in children looks like, or this is what a good parent looks like, our society's roles and scripts have tremendous power over us. For more than 100 years, the parenting role, perhaps the most important script to control, has been handed to us by academia by the same people who teach Keynesian economics and Kantian philosophy. Perhaps, like me, you were trained from birth to accept academia as your church. Every conqueror since antiquity has known that he does not have to worry about those he has conquered. He just has to take over how their children are raised. It should not surprise us that in a culture where we benevolently dictate to our children, our government benevolently dictates to us. Ayn Rand said, politics, politics is the last consequence, the practical implementation of the fundamental ideas that dominate a given nation's culture. You cannot fight or change the consequences without fighting and changing the cause. If we don't want our government to be a benevolent dictatorship, our households cannot be benevolent dictatorships. If we want to live in a society more like Galt's Gulch, our households must be its model. Perhaps a lack of focus on parenting is the biggest flaw in the freedom movement. Human beings can relate to one another with either mutual respect and freedom or mutual attempts to control and force. Though we may idealize the former, we were all raised with the latter. And this makes it hard, even for us, to imagine any other way to parent. Objectivist William Thomas wrote, children regularly have to be restrained from doing what they want to do and forced to do something else. They have to be put to bed and made to wash. We have been offered this dichotomy our entire lives. Either we control our children or they live lives of chaos. Either we make our kids go to bed and wash or they won't. 
If that were the choice, I would agree with Thomas, but that choice is a trick. This is not the choice. Similarly, Nathaniel Brandon advises parents to be warm, but authoritative, and cites a study that was done in which four types of parents were studied. Warmly authoritative, coldly authoritative, warmly permissive, and coldly permissive. Again, if those are the only choices, then by all means, I agree, parents should be warmly authoritative. But again, the choice is a trick. What we are being offered is a false dichotomy, a dichotomy that only makes sense as long as we are stuck in what I call the operating system of control and force. If a study were done on whether people prefer to exploit or be exploited in a trade, everyone listening to this lecture, I think, would see right through it. They would explain the operating system of freedom and respect in which they trade value for value, in which they would neither be exploited or exploit in a trade. But this explanation would be incomprehensible to those who operate in the system of control, in which employers and employees are always adversaries trying to take advantage of one another. No matter how hard we try to explain that trade can be a win-win, people who operate in the system of control can only see things on the spectrum of control. Either you are exploiting me or I am exploiting you. Either I sacrifice myself to others or they sacrifice themselves to me. When my son was two years old, people kept asking me, is he defiant yet? This question would only make sense to someone who operates in the system of control. I don't operate there, so I would say something like, well, to be defiant, one must have someone to defy. There must be a ruler and a subject, someone in control and someone being controlled. I don't, I don't relate to my son that way. Ah, the people would say, smiling sadly at me, you're permissive. You just let your son do whatever he wants. If I'm not authoritative, I must be permissive. If I'm not the master, I must be the slave. This is the same false dichotomy. It's as if there are two operating systems and to live in one negates the existence of the other. Rue Cream wrote, you say you have to pick him up and take him to the bath. I like to question my have-tos, especially when they are leading to unhappiness for my children. What would happen if you didn't pick him up and take him? What would happen if he didn't take a bath that night? What message is he getting from being picked up and put somewhere he doesn't want to be? Is it truly more important that he take a bath than it is for the two of you to build a respectful relationship? William Glasser wrote, the vast majority of family unhappiness is the result of well-intentioned parents trying to make children do what they don't want to do. Few of us parents are prepared to accept that it is our attempts to control that destroys the only thing we have with our children that gives us some control over them, our relationship. And I'm going to say that again, but I'm going to replace the word control um, the second time with influence and the word children with anyone. The vast majority of unhappiness in our relationships is the result of well-intentioned people trying to make other people do what they don't want to do. Few of us are prepared to accept that it is our attempts to control that destroys the only thing we have with another person that gives us some influence over them, our relationship. The choice isn't control or chaos. The choice in human relationships doesn't change based on the age of the people involved. The choice is mutual respect or mutual attempts to control. Mutual respect is the other way to parent. In my relationship with my son, I see myself as an ambassador for this fabulous place I live, Galt's Gulch, and I see my son as a distinguished visitor from a far-off land who doesn't understand my customs. It is my goal to help him thrive in my land, but not at the point of a gun. Instead, I strive to respect him, to understand his strange culture, and to show him how to respect me in my strange culture. When we run into a situation in which one of us is doing something that bothers the other, Perhaps he wants to throw beans on the floor and I don't want him to, or perhaps I want to leave the park and he doesn't want to. I think some version of, this is what I want. This is what my distinguished visitor wants. What can we do to get both of our needs met in this situation? 
I think the best way to clarify these ideas is with concrete examples. And I will start with a newborn baby because often people can imagine how they would treat older children with respect, but it's very hard for them to understand how they would give respect to a lump. So hold on. Let's look another sip of water. Okay, so scenario one, a newborn baby and how he is fed. The controlling mom sees it as her job to get food into her baby. So she brings her baby to her breast, tickles his cheek to trigger his mouth opening reflex and puts her breast in his mouth. My proposed respectful mom does not think it would be respectful to just put something in someone's mouth, even a quadriplegic. She brings her baby to her breast so that her nipple is near his nose and mouth and he can smell what she is offering. If he wants to nurse, he can open his own mouth to do so. Scenario two, a newborn baby and when he is fed. The controlling mom believes it is her job, she is supposed to, feed her baby every two hours. She has a handy little device that goes off every two hours, so she knows it's time to feed the baby. If he acts hungry before the two hours is up, she distracts him so that he learns to wait two hours. The respectful mom thinks refusing to feed her distinguished visitor when she's capable of accommodating him is disrespectful. So she feeds her baby when he's hungry. Maybe it's been one hour, maybe it's been three. Assuming these are interaction patterns and not single events, here is an analysis of what has been learned. The respected baby is responsible for his eating. His mind is learning to connect the sensation of hunger with the solution, food. He must learn to recognize the sensation of hunger and communicate that to his mother. He has found a benevolent universe and he already sees himself as a capable actor in it. The controlled baby has food shoved into his mouth, whether he wants it or not, and it will be done when the clock says whether he's hungry or not. In his mind, the connection between hunger and food has not been made. Likewise, he has learned nothing about communication or self-assertion except that it doesn't work. This baby will oscillate between feelings of frustration and anger as he fails repeatedly to communicate to his mother and passive resignation as he tries to accept the universe that he has found. For the moms, the respectful mom is getting in tune with her baby. The controlling mom is getting in tune with her alarm clock. And whether she means to or not, she's showing her baby who is in control. It's not him. It's also not her. It's the alarm clock and the, and the script it represents. She's just doing what she has been told. Scenario three, a teething one-year-old bites his mom while nursing. The controlling mom believes it is her job to teach her child not to bite people. When he bites her, she gives him a disapproving look and says, bad boy, no biting. Then she picks him up and puts him in timeout for one minute because that's how long timeouts are when you are one year old. The respectful mom first responds authentically to what happened. She says, ow, you hurt me. She looks her baby in the eye, communicating her pain and says, please don't bite me, but, and she looks around and grabs a nearby doll, you want to bite. Here's something you can bite, it won't hurt the doll. The analysis, <clears throat> the controlled baby has learned that he is bad, that his desire to bite is bad. He has learned that some people get to control others that he's not the one in control, and that he has to please those who are in control or he will suffer. He has learned that not only should he not want what he wants, trying to get what he wants could lead to pain. The respected baby has learned that it's okay for him to want what he wants. He wants to bite and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with him. There's no shame. On the contrary, his mother supports his desire to learn what he wants to learn, and she will help him get those needs met in a way that also works for her. Scenario four, eating dinner with a four-year-old. The controlling mom believes it is her job to get food into her child, especially vegetables. In order to accomplish this goal, she does a variety of things, begging him to take one more bite, bribing him with dessert, making macaroni and cheese every night because he won't eat anything else, and making vegetable purees and sneaking them into his macaroni and cheese. The respectful mom knows she wants to eat dinner, and shares whatever she makes for herself with her child, just as she has since he was a baby. Tonight, she makes bratwurst, sauerkraut, and mashed potatoes. What her child decides to do at this point is his business. She talks to him during dinner. She never even looks at his plate. The controlled child has learned that he has to eat whether he is hungry or not. 
He has been taught not to listen to his body, to ignore his own perceptions of reality. He has been taught that sometimes you have to be very sneaky to make people do what you want. He has learned that he does have some power in his relationship with his mom, the power to refuse food. And he enjoys using that to get a little revenge on her. The respected child has been in charge of his eating since he was a baby. He has been eating whatever his mom makes since he was a baby. Sometimes he eats it, sometimes he doesn't, especially if it's a new food. Sometimes he doesn't even taste it. He eats vegetables when he wants to, but there has never been any pressure or guilt. He has no guilt associated with food. Eating is all his deal, his responsibility. He has learned that he is capable of taking care of himself in this way. He has learned to trust his body, to tell him how much to eat, that his perceptions of reality are valid. He knows that his body belongs to him. For me, the easiest part of moving into the system of respect was relating to my son as a foreign dignitary. The hardest part was learning how to deal with his strong emotions. All children and adults experience very strong emotions. Communicating in a respectful way with children and adults who are feeling strong emotions is a learned skill, and failing to learn this skill is the main reason why many parents who want to have a respectful relationship with their children revert to various control tactics. In fact, I don't think having a mutually respectful relationship with children is even possible if the adult doesn't learn this skill. So here is the wonderful problem with my parenting theory. We cannot give our children what we don't have. This is psychological economics. That means this skill we must learn starts with us, the adults. It starts with how we think about our own strong emotions. We have been socialized with many ideas about emotions that are extremely destructive. One of them is this idea about emotional control. Since most people begin with the assumption that emotions are primary, they seek ways to control and influence their emotional states. But our emotions let us know how we're doing. They point us in the right direction. They let us know what's working and what needs our attention. Our strong emotions tell us, pay attention to this. If we listen, our emotions can be great aids in the pursuit of our values. But attempting to manipulate them, like attempting to command what we see or hear, is just refusing to acknowledge reality. It doesn't change reality, and it does not serve us. Nathaniel Brandon wrote, mental health does not require total omniscience about the contents and operation of one's subconscious but it does require the total absence on the conscious and subconscious level of any premise forbidding knowledge. It requires that man place no value above awareness, which means no value above the ability to perceive, the ability to be conscious. Earlier, I explained that a controlling approach to raising children creates a great deal of emotional repression, the forbidding of knowledge. The parenting in Galt's Gulch must yield the opposite. No repressions, no forbidden knowledge, external or internal. This is hard to picture because most of us were raised to believe that we are good when we keep ourselves under control and bad when we lose control. When we lose control, we must, as quickly as possible, get ourselves back under control, often by hiding, alone and ashamed, until our strong feelings have subsided. Perhaps with the help of alcohol, food, sex, pharmaceuticals, television, computer games, or excessive sleep or work. But just like our children, we are not actually getting in control so much as we are repressing our feelings. When I first pictured what unrepressed feelings might look like, I imagined a horror show of people freaking out irrationally all the time. And then I realized I was still thinking in the operating system of control. It's the same false dichotomy as before, only this time the threat is within. Either you control your emotions or they control you. Either you are the master of your emotions or you're their slave. I would like to propose that again, this is not the choice. The actual choice when it comes to our emotions, our inner reality is not between control and chaos, but again, between control and respect. The path to emotional awareness starts with treating emotions with respect. The choice is to know what we feel 
or to not know what we feel, consciousness or unconsciousness. Ayn Rand said, if men identified introspectively their inner states one-tenth as correctly as they identified their objective reality, we would be a race of ideal giants. I ascribe 95% or more of all psychological trouble and personal tragedies to the fact that in the realm of introspection, men are not only not taught to introspect, they are actively discouraged from engaging in it, and yet their lives depend on it. Introspection means constantly asking the questions, what do I feel, and why do I feel it? And having the emotional skills to answer these questions with a great deal of conscious awareness. To quickly summarize a very complex process, this means, according to Nathaniel Brandon, one, we must not repress. We cannot examine a value we are not willing to realize we have. We cannot get a need met if we don't know what we need. We must know what we know. We must acknowledge what we are feeling, whatever we are feeling, the desire to hit our child, the desire to kick a dog, etc. If we judge an emotion as bad or undesirable, we will automatically repress it. So it is essential that the acknowledgement is non-judgmental and respectful. Acknowledging that one is experiencing the emotion will stop the repression, and that is the goal. This is why music or movies can help us sometimes. We were repressing something. And then a certain song comes on, and it helps to bring our feelings to the surface, and we finally cry. Two, we must feel what we are feeling. Some psychological theories recommend saying, I'm angry, and then watching the anger as if it is not our anger. These theories teach us to not take responsibility for our feelings. Other popular theories tell us to acknowledge our negative feelings so as not to repress them, but then to find something more positive to focus on. What you focus on expands, they say. So don't focus on your negative emotions. But if we don't focus on them, we cannot learn anything from them. Nathaniel Brandon advises us to go into our emotions and invite them into our conscious awareness. This step is crucial because this is how we gather as much information as possible. Emotions must be felt all the way because surface feelings are often misleading. For example, I know that when I feel depressed, if I bring that depression into my conscious awareness and allow myself to feel it, I usually find that I'm just tired. If I don't take a minute to feel the depression, I mistakenly think that depression is the problem rather than exhaustion. Brandon wrote, learning the art of relating to emotions in this way is not easy. Virtually everyone initially encounters difficulty. Therapy clients comment on their emotions. They explain their emotions. They apologize for their emotions. They speculate as to the historical origins of their emotions, and of course they reproach and even ridicule themselves for their emotions, but they find it extraordinarily difficult to simply let themselves feel their emotions. If we are willing to stay fully present in our emotions without denial or disowning, the result typically is not the collapse of reason, but the emergence of a more lucid awareness. In other words, feel, de feel deeply to think clearly. Three, we must reflect. Some psychological theories instruct us to ride the wave of an emotion. That's all we have to do, since we are just victims of emotion that just happens to wash over us. And though simply experiencing an emotion can be enough in some circumstances, emotions are not causeless, and they should be examined. For example, I acknowledged my feelings of depression. I realized I was really feeling exhaustion. Now, rather than shrug, have a cup of coffee, and go on with my day, I examine the decisions I have made that led to my feelings of exhaustion. I become more aware of my limits and take action to plan my schedule more appropriately. Then I must examine the depression. What abstract rule or judgment led me to mistake exhaustion for depression? In this particular case, I feel deeply ashamed of my own exhaustion and don't want to admit my limits. I would rather be depressed than admit that I'm tired. This is important information. Only with awareness of my inaccurate abstractions can I change them. Our children will only be able to acknowledge, feel, and examine their own uncomfortable feelings if we can model this for them and guide them from day one. Recall scenario two from the last chapter concerning when to, f sorry, the, from a little bit ago, um, concerning when to feed a baby. When the respectful mom can accommodate her baby, she does. But sometimes 
she cannot accommodate her baby. Perhaps her baby communicates to her that he is hungry, but she's in the middle of cooking dinner, or perhaps she's driving home and it would be dangerous to pull over. At these times, the respectful mom tells her baby honestly that she knows what he wants, but she cannot accommodate him. She does not attempt to distract him from his disappointed feelings, but rather she listens empathetically to him while he expresses his disappointment. Her baby learns that sometimes his actions will not yield what he wants. Sometimes he will feel disappointment, and that's okay. Compare this to what the controlled baby learns. Whenever he is upset, his mother distracts him from how he feels. Sometimes with bouncing motions, sometimes by shoving something shiny in his face, the controlled baby has gotten the message that the emotion he was expressing is not okay. And when he feels that emotion, he should distract himself. As he gets older, he will continue to distract himself with television, computer games, pharmaceuticals, work, sugar, alcohol, sex, or some other drug that enables him to maintain a facade of control. We can use any substance as a spice to spice up our lives, as a medicine to change how we're feeling, or as a drug to numb out and repress. All my life, I thought I was managing my emotions expertly with a combination of chocolate, wine, movies, and work when I needed them. But as I learned more about psychology, I realized that our drugs enable us to live lives we couldn't otherwise be living. Without our drugs and our medicines, we have to feel what we're feeling, and it's miserable. But it is those very feelings, that very torture, that leads us to change our lives, to make decisions that lead us to a life that we don't need to medicate or numb ourselves away from. Then we can use our various substances only as spices to enrich our lives. We cannot give our children what we ourselves do not possess. Drug addicts and self-medicators will most likely raise drug addicts and self-medicators. We live in a culture in which various drugs are the approved way for us to deal with our strong emotions. No one told us when we were children to feel these uncomfortable feelings that it was okay. So this kind of parenting that I recommend requires a great deal of reparenting ourselves. Because we do not get to be warmly benevolent dictators to our children, but we absolutely do want to influence what kind of people they become. Our only option is to have an awesome, present, respectful relationship with ourselves and our children, and to model how to live an awesome life. This is actually a far more effective way to parent because according to Nathaniel Brandon, regardless of what we think we're teaching with all of our force and control, we teach what we are. The only way to raise a hero is to be one. So instead of obsessing over our children and trying to control them, trying to make them be the person we dream they could be, the best way to parent is to focus on ourselves and make ourselves the person we dream of being. Instead of, how can I get my kid to do what I know is best? The parents of Galt's Gulch think, be the hero you wish to see in your children. And so we find a solution to the following complaints many young people make to their therapists about their parents. And if you want to, you can close your eyes here um, <clears throat> to truly hear them. My parents never truly saw me. They didn't understand me, the real me. When I was telling them what I needed, they didn't listen to me. When I was telling them what I did not need, they didn't listen to me. They didn't take me seriously. They didn't treat my thoughts, my values, myself with respect. And worst of all, they worked so hard for my happiness. When all I wanted, what I desperately needed, was to see theirs, to be inspired, to see the kind of life that is possible on this earth. My vision of the heroic parents of Galt's Gulch is the opposite of the above quote. They truly see their children in this moment. They truly understand their children, their real children, not their imagined ones. They listen to what their children say they need and they respect what their children say they don't need. 
They take their children seriously. They treat their children's thoughts, values, and selves with respect, and they inspire their children by how they live their lives. Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Our current parenting tools are not the tools with which a more free society can be built. In fact, they are the tools that tear it down. Remember, the method is the message. When we live in the operating system of control, when we use the tools of control to fight for freedom and respect for individuals, when we fail to move out of that system psychologically, we've already lost. Our outer world reflects our inner world. This goes two ways. Right now, our government reflects our households, benevolent dictatorships, and our households reflect our personal psychological status, the operating system of control. Our current outer world does, in fact, reflect our current inner world. There is no contradiction here. If we want our outer world to be one of freedom and respect, our households and our own personal psychology must reflect that. If you dream of spending your life trying to get other people to fight for freedom, you have probably not found freedom. Today, I think of Galt's Gulch as a psychological place in which you treat yourself with respect and freedom. So it's natural to give it to others. Where inside you feel, it doesn't get any better than this. All right, that is the, uh, the end of my talk. Um, I guess open for questions. Hello. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, very powerful, very inspiring. And I have a million questions of my own, but I will belay those for now and um, go with our audience to begin with, at least. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We did get several requests for a bibliography. I found those on your blog, and I posted them in the chat. Uh, but we also had requests for some of the studies that you cite, and maybe those are cited in the books. But if there's a more uh, sub-bibliography or a place you can point people at where to find these, these studies that back up what you're saying. This speech is a um, shortened version of my book. And my book is uh, available on Amazon.com. And, and in the book, everything is cited. Um, okay. Uh, that's I, – I don't put – Enough. I don't put very much effort into my blog. It's kind of like where I just jot things down. Um, so the book really is the best source of the um, the the sources. Okay. Well, forgive me. What's the name of the book? Let's get that in here. <laughs> uh, it's called A Theory of Objectivist Parenting. A Theory of Objectivist Parenting. Okay. We'll put a link up it's to a, there. It's uh, a short little book. I think the best part about it is um is the reading list at the end. I do give a fantastic reading list of uh, at, at the end. Um, but otherwise, yeah, one day when I have time, I will make my blog more uh, developed. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Another question we have is that um, psychologists often say that parents have only a fractional influence on their children's development compared to environment and genetics. Ooh, uh, I have what, a great blog post what, about that on my blog. And okay. so what I will huh? Go ahead, go. Oh. What I will say off the top of my head, you should really check the blog post, go to my blog and look for it. Um, we don't raise our children anymore. I would, I would argue that parents have a tremendous influence on their children if they raise them. But if you send your kids off to daycare when they're six months old or three months old or two years old and you don't see them again, of course you don't have any influence over them. Um, we, I, I think it's fascinating how parents aren't raising their children. And I have read several books on um, the influence, on the peer influence of your children. And it's the same thing. Like you take a bunch of, you take, you take your three-year-old and you stick him in a room with a bunch of other three-year-olds and they all create their own little world. Um, yeah, he's not going to act like you. He's not spending any time with you. The average parent, I think, has, um, oh no, I forget the statistics. There's something insane. Like the average parent talks to their child for less than an hour a week in quality conversation. <laughs> the average homeschooled child talks, has I think seven to eight hours a week of quality conversation with their parents. Um, but it, it's insane. Um, of course you don't have any, yeah. There's no, and then there's another thing. Um, I also think it's very interesting that we are families. We don't influence each other 
that much anymore either. Uh, psychologically, there's really interesting literature on this. A book comes to mind called Connected um, about how the people you spend the most time with influence you as a person. So we're all growing every day. You too, me too. All of us are changing just a little bit every day. And those changes are based upon what will lead us to thrive in, in our environment. Now, everybody's environment is generally their place of work. It's not your home. You're not changing a little bit every day to get along better with your wife and your children. You're changing a little bit every day. You're being influenced a little bit every day by the people you spend the most time with, which is the people at the office. So you, the people you spend the most time with, they will... they. It, it, obesity is contagious, um, happiness is contagious, unhappiness is contagious, all of these things, uh, wealth is contagious. You are going to catch from the people you spend the most time. Our children don't catch our habits. And, and often, our husbands don't catch our habits either. Our husbands catch their habits from work, and we catch our habits from our work, and we're going in this direction, and our husband is going in this direction, and our children are going in this direction, and you have, you have three different people li living three separate lives who are supposed to magically come home and enjoy dinner together. No, I just can't understand my husband at all. Say again? It was a joke. I said, I just can't understand my husband at all. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, we have another question here, and that is, uh, it says, how does child worshipping in the U.S. affect the new generation? I assume he means what Brandon would have called the cult of pseudo-self-esteem. Wait, what? What's the question? The question is, how does child worshipping in the United States affect the new generation? I interpret this to mean what Brandon would have called the cult of pseudo-self-esteem. Yeah. Right? We tell the children all the time, everything they do is wonderful. Oh, that! Yeah, that's awful. I mean, that's just <laughs> lies. It's just basic, inauthentic lies. <laughs> Lying to anyone. Um, I guess the question is, what are the psychological consequences for an entire generation raised like this? Well, there's been a lot of studies done on the on my generation um, <laughs> uh, and how, and it's so true. We're so, I shouldn't say we. I found when I was 22 or so that I was extremely inauthentic. I was going to work every day going, you know what, I would really like it if they would just give me a review every six months with some grades. I would really like some grades. I would, I would like to know that I'm doing a good job. Like without that praise from my boss, without, without that, I don't even know if there's a point to what I'm doing. And um, that, it, it really hit me in my 20s, like without that little pat on the head, like, you're such a good girl, you are good, you are doing what you should. Like, without that, I just, there was nothing in the world that I wanted. There was nothing that I enjoyed doing just for the sake of doing it. Um, so I, I mean, maybe, well, and I, I have spoken to a lot of people, especially after I give this lecture, um, a lot of people have had similar experiences about finding that they just have no, no intrinsic self whatsoever. And I think that I mean, that's, that is in the book Punished by Rewards by Afi Cohen, like that is literally what happens when you raise children with this system of rewards and punishments. And remember that saying, good job, good job, is just as controlling as saying, bad boy. Like, it's the same. Praise and rewards are both an attempt to control the other person. There, there's no, one is not better than the other. So, you know, my generation may have been raised without the punishments, but we were raised with the rewards. So there's really, it's not different. Did I answer the question? More or less. Um, we're almost out of time, but I'll ask real quickly. Somebody says or asks, if a child takes somebody else's toy, we must tell them that it's bad. How do we do that better? Um, so I completely disagree with that. There's a great book called It's Okay Not to Share. Um, if somebody grabs your phone from you, should your husband really say, honey, let her hold it? Or like if, if somebody walks in and if this other woman is like, oh my God, I love your wedding ring. Can I just, can you share that with me? It's like, no. No, I don't want to share that with you. No, I think that you've got the question backwards. The, the question is that child A takes the, to the toy by force from child B. Child oh. A must be corrected. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you're nearby enough to say, oh, I'm not going to let you take that toy. Oh, I see you're trying to grab the toy. Um, however, actually, you can't really answer this question without knowing the exact age of the child because you actually do. There's another great book on this called Dear Parents, How to Raise Infants with Respect for Children ages three and under. And then there's a great book called uh, The Toddler Years, which all of these are on my bibliography in red because they're the best books, for how to deal with kids three through six. 
Um, so there's, and then there's, it's okay not to share, which is fine. It's not as amazing as the other two. It's fine. Um, but yeah, I absolutely do protect my son's property. Um, but it, it just, there's so many, that's a hypothetical situation that depends on the circumstances. Like, is my son playing with somebody else's toy or is that his toy? And did the child successfully grab it? Am I now, did my son care? Because if my son didn't care, you know, there's no problem. Um, often, if you wait a minute, the kids really don't care very much. Um, and then, it, but if you've taught your child that that a child doesn't have the right to do that, they will care and they will cry and they'll be like, that child is bad, he's a bad boy. Um, okay, we're going to have to stop here. I would love to go for another hour. We probably could get more questions to keep it going for another hour. Uh, you've really got people thinking here. Somebody just bought your book while we were talking. Yes! Uh, <laughs> a good response. I have, I have another one that's going to come out soon. I'm, I have so much to say. But, um. Well, good. Uh, but we do have to go. Um, and so all I can say right now is just thank you so much, and we will hopefully carry on this conversation. Uh, but have a great day or evening or morning, wherever you are, and all of our audience. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Remember, you need to click on the fresh links for each talk. Uh, thanks for listening, and have a great day.